LSD as science views it. Here is Dr. Joel Elkis, an authority on brain chemistry and director of the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. Let me ask you a question. We have just seen a, a patient of whom uh, her husband said LSD simply changed uh, hate to love. Yes. Is that really what happened? Well, uh, the love must have been there all the time and the ways in which we often defend against love, which means an involvement, a real involvement, and therefore dependence on a person, is to withdraw or to change it to the other valency of hate. If you say it changed hate to love, it is simply, the experience has simply brought the patient to a point where he can accept love and therefore the possibility of loss of love more. But a drug did that. A drug did that in a, certain, in a certain situation. A drug did it after very careful preparation of the patient, uh, after work with the patient, which allowed him to realize some of the possible profound misconceptions which he's had about himself. So, uh, in this respect, a drug is very useful. But do not say that, do not give the impression that a drug applied to a patient will change love to hate, because if, if that patient had had hate, 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 I think what you'd see is, is more hate. This drug is serious business. But what has happened is that this drug has been used in open settings that claims and extravagant claims have been made for it, which are applied indiscriminately in particularly young people who in some way e seek an instant paradise. The facts are that we should take this drug very seriously, that we should by all means control it in, and make it available to serious investigators, but that we should not simply, by emphasizing the negative aspects of this drug, swamp the very important potential which is there. What we saw happen here at Cottage 13 seems worth taking seriously in exactly the way that Dr. Elkis suggests as a possibility and as a warning. Six months afterwards, Peg McGinnis has been restored to her family, and Arthur King has already beaten the percentages on alcoholism. Within six months after the conventional cures, nine out of 10 have gone back to drinking. Spring Grove's figures suggest that they are getting results about three times as good as that, but the statistics are so sketchy and so short term that they don't constitute any sort of proof. Our own sample, of course, is too small even to add up to a statistic. We followed two patients, and both happened to be doing fine, which couldn't be better news, but which leaves out the far more numerous cases in which LSD therapy has produced no beneficial results. The point is that even with Peg and Otz, there is no miracle cure, there is improvement. And it isn't a drug that did it, but an understanding of themselves, which they achieved with the help of the drug, achieved it under the closest supervision, and only after weeks of intensive psychotherapy. The drug is nothing without the psychotherapy. It can hardly take the place of that process that to so many people means years of probing. It is not, as Dr. Elkis suggests, it is not a form of instant psychotherapy any more than it is a source of instant paradise. Yet something did happen here in Cottage 13, something that is still waiting to be explained. And it has to do with the potent mystery called LSD. It is serious. It is dangerous. It belongs in the hands of science, which understands the dangers, and yet also dimly sees the promise on that farthest frontier, the human mind. This is Charles Kuralt. Good evening. Spring Grove would eventually change administrations, and the LSD studies would be dropped after years marked by both failure and success. But Dr. Curland recently told us a new generation of researchers hopes to resume some experiments, in effect picking up where he left off. They're experiments that will owe much to the astonishing cases of Peg McGinnis and Arthur King. Dr. Curland last heard from Peg in 1995 when she sent him a book of her unpublished poems, a testament he believes to her resilience and her recovery. Arthur King, or Otts, has also made remarkable strides. CBS revisited him in 1993. 
As far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't take a million dollars for the peace of mind that I obtained from this therapy. It was that good, that refreshing, that rejuvenating. And that enduring. As for the man behind the Spring Grove experiment, now in his 80s, Dr. Curland is still practicing at a private psychiatric hospital in Maryland. Of those long ago trials at Spring Grove, he told us simply, life is hard and man's need to escape himself cannot be overestimated. I'm Mike Wallace, and those are the people who touched our lives from CBS Classics. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is. It's a Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. I'll see you on the radio. Good night and good luck.